Okay, well, good morning uh, to you all. Um, I, I hope uh, yesterday was uh, instructive. There was a tremendous amount of material, I realize, and um, I went through it very quickly. And, uh, you know, again, uh, as we go through the summer and we start producing some videos, uh, it will uh, hopefully um, uh, illustrate some of the methodology uh, that I was talking about. You know, of course, you realize that last night, last night and tonight, <laughs> yesterday and today, um, I'm trying to give you background uh, theory, if you will, as well as some uh, uh, detailed information. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions arose um, from last night's lecture, and some of them I can, uh, I'll try to answer. Um, the first one, and I think, do you see this uh, um, uh, text on the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So one of the first questions was how to start screening from several hundred isolates uh, of, a, of a, a fungus or a virus or bacterium. Uh, how do you, you know, it, it, it seems like it's an overwhelming task. Um, and you have to compromise between uh, how many isolates you get in, how many uh, isolates you make, and that is also depending on, on your ability to get these isolates or you obtain isolates from a culture collection. Uh, and you're trying to identify the best ones using those multiple criteria that I, I, I uh, told you. Uh, my experience has been that you, you, in some ways, it's a, as we say in America, luck of the draw of cards. And sometimes you get the king and queen of a, a card. Other times you get a two or three. And it's, it's not terribly predictable. Um, when I was uh, doing that uh, study for the Pulex that I illustrated yesterday, um, you know, we started with about 125 isolates, uh, which we felt represented um, a fair distribution. At the same time, you cannot be perfect. You know, you're trying to find the best ones available. Uh, and part of that, what is the best one, is also spore production. So it's not necessarily virulence, although it, it, that is a component. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, in my own experience, many of the very virulent isolates of Bovaria metarhizium don't produce very many spores in mass production. And so you, get a, you do a compromise. I will address some of this today in today's lecture. But how do you do it? So um, in that one example for Pulex, it was well over 100 isolates. Um, in USDA, my goal was to find a fungus to control grasshoppers. You may know, know them as locusts, acridity. It's a big problem in the Western US here, although it's not the same type of phenomenon that you have in Asia and in Africa where the locusts fly and fill the skies. Uh, there I started with 400 isolates. Uh, but that's perhaps a reflection of my own personality. Um, sometimes I make more work for myself. I am too diligent, if you will. When I, in the 1980s, when I worked for the multinational company, uh, our target was a beetle called the uh, corn rootworm, which attacks the corn. It's the most important pest of corn. And uh, there, because of some very good fortune, I was able to make 1,100 isolates. And because I had a team of technicians to help me, 
we screened in bioassay all 1200 or 1100 um, and we got a, a, a uh, if you can imagine a bell-shaped curve we use a, a, a virulence um, and the difference between the two sides of the bell-shaped curve was a dose of about uh, a thousand fold um, that is perhaps overkill you know um, other endeavors when if you see in the publications in the literature uh, you will see maybe somebody taking 10 isolates 20 isolates that's uh, perhaps limiting things but it is a dilemma if you are trying to develop and commercialize um, a fungus for uh, either a specific insect or the major insect pests in your region, um, you know, it's a dilemma. Uh, my best advice is to, to do uh, at least 100 isolates from different sources, from the insect, from other insects, from a culture collection. You know, if you go to this RCEF collection I mentioned yesterday, there is an online catalog. 10,000 isolates. Uh, and the catalog lists uh, the, the insect of origin, uh, as well as some, uh, and also the geographic origin. And uh, you can go through the catalog and uh, with a little money, uh, I think it costs about $50 US to obtain a strain, each strain uh, from the culture collection. And some people do this, but it's hard. In terms of the screening, let's say we have 400 isolates. The Ideal is this two-dose bioassay, comparing it against some known isolate, let's say a commercial isolate from America, GHA, strain of Bovaria. Okay, and you run. But if you cannot do that, then what is typically done is in terms of a, either a spray or a immersion type of bioassay where the insect is immersed in a spore suspension. Typically, people use one times 10 to the seventh spores per milliliter. It's a good, as good a place as any to start, especially if you have 400. And then you just look at the, the mortality, let's say at seven days, and uh, at the, what I call maximum of 14 days. Okay, so that again, so that kind of simplifies a little bit. It is still a lot of work. Um, again, uh, with the question number two, what is the high dose and low dose in general to de design a bioassay? Well, it's based on um, some standard. So you, you take a strain, um, ideally a commercial strain, uh, let's say the G American GHA or the, the BASF has their Velifer strain, it's called PPRI 5339, uh, and so on, and you compare everything against that. Now part of the rationale of doing that is that could be the competition. If you are a small medium enterprise and uh, you are um, uh, possibly uh, going to compete with BASF's Bovaria or um, Certus's Bovaria, well, that's that is the basis for comparison to find something that's a little better, both in terms of um, virulence and also mass production. Um, and so then you do two doses. So, so first, as I mentioned last night, although rather in a hurry, you take your standard strain. Let's 
for now we would say GHA strain, and you run a multiple dose bioassay using whatever method you're going to use, spray or immersion, um, whatever, um, and you, using the multiple dose bioassay, you identify um, a dose that kills 20% of the insects and a dose that kills 80% of the insects. Okay. And those two figures, as I gave in the example, let's see if I have, um, did I, yeah, I pulled it up. Um, pardon me for virulence. I mean, for um, giving you a dizzy, a headache. Um, Ah, so here on this, uh, this, where is this my example? Oh, oh okay, great. Uh, so here on this particular example. Um, Stephen, we this, still see the Word document. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. I have to shift it. I am, my apologies. Um, there we go. Um, so your, your standard strain, so for this argument, we're saying GHA. You run a multiple dose bioassay, a screening assay. So uh, you uh, uh, expose the insects to uh, 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th spores per milliliter. And you get a dose response. And you try to identify um, a dose that gives you about 20% kill. In this case, for this example, 7.5 times 10 to the sixth per milliliter. And this is derived from the regression of the, of the mortality versus the dose. At the same time, you go for something that is an LD80. Why the two doses? Uh, this is, gives you a little more information. Certainly, if you've got 400 isolates and you want to find something that is as good or better than the standard strain, you go with the LD20. Okay, so everything, so presumably, if, if the strains are as good or worse than your standard, they would be very low mortality. But if a strain is better, it will stand out all of a sudden your standard is 20 percent or you're getting 80 percent with strain x if you have the ability to do the two doses you get a little bit of extra information uh, and one of them is an estimate of the slope of mortality versus the dose those slopes can differ. And you can have two strains, uh, and the LD50s are about the same. But if one strain has a, a, a steeper slope, the result will be that the LD90 where you want to be killing most of the insects will occur at a lower dose. Okay, and to, to get that information on a, on a limited level, you use the two doses, and then you, you, do, you make a, a approximation of the slope. It's not terribly accurate because there's only two points, but it gives you an estimate. So you want something that has a high slope, why a high slope? The slope is the change in mortality with the change in dose. A low slope means you need many, many, many more spores to get an increment in mortality. And typically with these fungi, the slope is very low. Uh, using the, the, uh, what's called the, the probit log dose regression, the slope is usually less than one. In contrast, if a chemical, the slope is 10, 15. 
okay? BT, a slope of Bacillus thuringiensis for caterpillars or uh, some of the diptera, the slope is typically about four or five. With the fungi, it's generally down at one or even less than one, which means you need many, 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 many more spores to get a 10% or 20% increase in mortality. Okay, and that has practical implications in the field. Uh, you're applying, uh, if you, you know, you're getting 50% uh, kill in the field to get 100% with a strain that has a, demonstrates a low slope. You may need 100 pounds of bovaria. Okay. Whereas if you have a, uh, a strain that has a higher slope, that means the field rate, the LD90, LD100, is going to be a lower amount of material. Okay. So that's, that's the real main use. Um, I also like to have the two doses because uh, the L, uh, the data from the LD80 identifies things that are much worse than the strain that is the basis of comparison, the strain that is the standard. And it, it gives you some, some uh, more information. It's what I call the losers. You identify the losers in the crowd. But again, if you have a lot of strains and you only have so many insects, you can go with one dose and go with the LD20 or a, just a low dose uh, using, uh, and that's based on the standard. Okay. All right, now I'll switch back. Uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, share screen. Okay. Um, all right. So that's. Um, um, I'm hoping that answers uh, this particular question. Uh, now, the third question, during solid substrate, how to select the best one for different genera like Bovaria or Metarhizium? What is the criterion? Uh, so in general, uh, Bovaria will produce more spores per kilogram of substrate. Um, most of the time. Uh, Metarhizium will produce less. Uh, and part of that reason is the different mode of sporulation. But in general, and I will address this, you have to balance uh, efficacy, virulence, with the spore production. And I'll give you an example in, in tonight's lecture. Um, how to determine adjust less than 7% moisture for Bavaria I, and, and, and um, Pisilomyces. I will address this in the in the um, uh, mass production tonight. Um, for biocontrol agent, what is bad growth? Optimum growth, good growth. Well, in vitro, it, its value measuring growth in vitro, such as the growth of a radial colony, is important only in terms of interpreting environmental, the effect of environmental variables as a way of predicting how quickly the fungus strain will kill the insect in the field. The biggest variable being temperature, of course. If the temperature is too hot, the fungus may not grow very well. I'll give you a case in point. The acridity, locusts and grasshoppers, have the ability to, uh, when they feel themselves diseased, they increase the amount of uh, exposing themselves to the sunlight. Um, it's called, and, and they raise their body temperatures to as high as 40, 41 uh, Celsius. Uh, the, the phenomenon is called behavioral fever. Um, and this behavioral fever uh, is a way of defeating in grasshoppers. Not all insects have behavioral fever. I've only seen it in grasshoppers, uh, musca domestica, housefly, 
um, and uh, the Japanese beetle, Papilia japonica, of the adults, where they will sit in the sun uh, trying to heat themselves up. Uh, so there it's very important to identify strains that can withstand those temperatures. Uh, if uh, also, if, uh, if you are intending to use the fungus when it is hot, you have to try to find a fungus that will grow in vitro, which is a reflection of in vivo growth uh, at those temperatures. Of course, we have a limit of, of, if you will, of safety, because if a Bovaria or Metarhizium grows at 37, then it is, has the potential to uh, infect a human being, especially one that is immunocompromised. Uh, in general, though, we healthy humans uh, can resist, the, uh, resist infection, um, the, and mainly because these fungi do not grow at 37. Um, so good growth, optimum growth, etc. It's a relative thing and in its importance really only in terms of interpreting the, the, the tolerance of the strain to in environmental factors, especially temperature. Uh, there is some relationship between speed of growth and speed of kill of the insect, but it's not entirely the growth rate. It has to do with uh, metabolites that are produced. And that's a question um, uh, he, uh, someone else was asking. What is the real cause of death in insects after penetration of Bovaria bassiana uh, and Metarhizium? Uh, the way these fungi uh, kill their hosts are, yes, metabolites. Bovaria uh, has fewer metabolites than metarhizium, and Bavaria kills its host more by consuming all of the carbohydrates and lipids inside the insect, and in a sense starving the insect, but also changing the pH of the hemolymph so that the, the insect organs, the tissues, do not function properly. Metarhizium, on the other hand, produces a whole series of uh, peptides, polypeptides, uh, called the destructins. And I think there's like 13 destructins known. Several of them are known to cause, basically to poison the insect host. One result is that an insect infected with Bovaria will take generally longer to die than an insect infected with Metarhizium. And that's because of all these metabolites. Okay. So in general, Bovaria will kill its insect within four, well, the fastest for tiny insect, four days, typically for something, let's say a nice beetle, or a nice uh, lepidopteran larva, uh, you're figuring five to even 10 days at a very high dose that kills most of the insects by the end of that time. Metarhizium is almost like a biological guillotine. It just kills everything that it's going to kill on the day five, day six, day seven. And any insects that survives beyond day seven um, probably wasn't infected. Okay. Um, let's see. Please tell me the efficacy of spore versus mycelial fragment. I'll get into this a little bit um, in, in tonight's lecture. Uh, which one is more efficacious in Bovaria? Well, the, the, the bottom line is aerial canidia. Mycelium produces the canidia. Okay. Um, I will uh, uh, send out a protocol for anyone that's interested on rearing uh, Galeria or Tenebrio. Um, uh, it's, the, the methods are, are well known, and uh, 
that's that. Um, why do I prefer fungi isolated from live insects exposed to Bovaria bassiana? Uh, in many cases, uh, finding infections in live insects is easier, is more efficient, if you will, than searching uh, the crop for dead insects uh, and ideally from sporulated insects most of the time. Uh, often with homoptera, for example, yeah, you can find fungus killed individual insects that where the fungus has sporulated. But generally, it's a lot of work. You have to look and look and look and look. Uh, whereas gathering several hundred or several thousand um, insects and then rear feeding them and rearing them and waiting for some to die is a relative i find a relatively efficient process to um, identify the pathogenic fungi as i described um, yesterday um, i'll give you an example in uh, mid 90s I was part of a project, we went to Madagascar, the Malagasy Republic, looking for uh, Bovaria metarhizium for locust control. And what we did was we literally collected um, thousands of locusts, put them in cages, fed them abundant foliage, and we collected about 20, 30 um, uh, isolates of metarhizium from those insects. So the, the locusts would die, we would collect every day, we would process the cadaver, and we could get the fungus. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, with, depending on the insect, um, it, you can find more infections by collecting the live insect. Okay. Um, but you can uh, typically when let's say u.s department of agriculture has gone out to do foreign exploration for pathogens of some insect that has invaded the united states they will go out and spend weeks uh, examining insect populations looking for the dead sporulated cadaver one of the problems is that um, infections are generally very low unless there's an unusual circumstance where you get an epidemic um and so and then these cadavers the, the insect dies of a fungus it disappears it falls to the ground and it, it disappears in the vegetation things like that okay um is there any difference in secondary metabolite production between in vivo and in vitro yes definitely um it, you know in vivo is is uh um the situation where the fungus responds uh, to its, uh, I'll call it desired environment, and produces a series of metabolites. In vitro, the, the, the media components are never exactly what the fungus likes, if you will. So depending on the medium, you can get meta metabolite expression or not. So, for example, um, if you take Bovaria and you put it in, in a liquid um, uh, potato dextrose broth, it won't produce one of the classic uh, metabolites called Osporine, which turns the medium red. But if you take that Bovaria and put it into something called Chapex Dox broth, it readily produces the Osporine. And this is a uh, you know this is a dilemma there I know there are groups including the multinational companies that have been looking for metabolites that they could make into chemical insecticides you know and they really haven't succeeded by the way um because uh, some of the most e efficacious metabolites are also uh, either phytotoxic or uh toxic to uh, vertebrates uh and fortunately they're rare um, so it's so it, it's in vivo in vitro is very very different uh, many cases uh, like with this osporine 
that I mentioned. It, uh, it classic in insects, it turns many of the insects a very characteristic red color. It's almost sort of a dark red. I call it osporine red. Not all the time, but many infected insects, especially ones that have a, a slightly translucent body, will turn this red color. But to take that isolate and in, an, in, uh, in vitro, it's, sometimes it can be very frustrating. The isolate will not produce oosperine. So, okay. Um, I'm certainly, I don't quite understand what this question is, specific relation between microbial pesticide insect. Um, if you're talking about specificity, um, the specificity, there is a, a degree of specificity where a strain of Bavaria would be perhaps best for Coleoptera and mediocre for other orders of insects. Or another strain would be very, very good for, let's say, fall armyworm, Spidoptera frugiperda, and perhaps some of the other Spidoptera, but not very good for other Lepidoptera. So there is that kind of specificity. But it's not like another group of fungi, the Enthemopterales, uh, which can cause epizootics, which are very host specific. Um, at the same time, these Enthemopterales, I'm not talking about them because they are extremely difficult to culture in vitro. In many cases, impossible. Um, so in general, the Ascomycetes, which are the ones that are being commercialized, um, they can have a narrow range. At the same time, if you use more of a mycopesticide based on a strain, you can overcome its mediocre performance that you would see in the laboratory. And, so, and I will talk about this a little later uh, during mass production. Uh, when there is commercial microbial pesticide that has no effect at all, is it due to wrong microbial isolation, evolutionary phenomenon? Um, well, if you're talking about a commercial micro, uh, microbial control, first thing I would check is, is it alive? Quality control is terrible in many companies. For example, uh, in 2020, I was working in Texas. Um, we were evaluating the American commercial fungi against a uh, uh, Asian citrus psyllid. Uh, this is the insect that vectors the citrus, citrus greening disease. It's so important in the United States. So we ordered commercial, uh, one commercial product. I got it in and I checked the viability, zero. So then I complained to the company and they sent me another, another lot of it and it was 60% viable. Uh, I, so I have this motto that I have developed in my career was in God I trust maybe, everything else I verify, especially the viability of a mycoinsecticide before I go ahead and use it. Um, so that's the first thing I would uh, suspect. You don't know how long it's been sitting in some distributor's warehouse, what the conditions are in the warehouse. Uh, perhaps there's a problem uh, with the company, with the production, and they did not do good quality control. Um, I, frankly, in Latin America, I see this oftentimes as a big problem. Uh, in looking at um, com uh, commercial products produced by small medium enterprises that do insufficient quality control, uh, the product is, is uh, half dead. Um, so it, it's not necessarily um, wrong microbe isolation. Um, misfit between the, the microbe. Uh, in the process of developing the fungus, you, you know, you're evaluating it in the field against the major insect, uh, insect pests. Okay, so that's enough of that. I killed a half hour, but um, so I hope those, those questions are answered. Um, if you have more questions, please write me. Um, and I will then uh, answer you uh, by email. 
Okay, so now I need to go to the today's lecture, which is mass production. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about a number of issues and also some con important considerations. So imagine yourself, you want to begin a company, mass produce a fungus in Sri Lanka or in Thailand. Um, there's a number of considerations. And I will also talk about how to do this, but the how is like cooking. There are many different Mr. recipes. Sir, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you please yes. make it full screen? I, oh, I thought I did have it. A slide. Okay. Is that, can you see that fungus mass production? Oh, we don't see the slide show. We still see the presentation. I uh, mean. Okay. Did the slide change? Yeah, we can see the slide changing, but okay. it is right, not good. in slideshow mode. It's in oh, okay. Mine is in. Oh, that's interesting. Mine's in slide sh slideshow mode. Um, hang on a second. Let me. Uh... Ah, there we go. Okay, thank you. Nothing like technology. Um, okay, so. Um, we're going to talk about mass production. Uh, this, by the way, is a barrel of pure Bavaria spores uh, that we produced in, in actually in 1995 as we were developing our mass production system. Uh, and it uh, totals about 120 pounds. So that would be about 60 kilograms of pure spores. Um, give you a, another little glimpse. Um, today I've been uh, harvest. Oops, I've been harvesting metarizium that I'm producing for a client, and so you know it's green. Metarizium is green. Whoops, it's hard to see. The, the, there we go. Uh, so that's uh, production from uh, uh, about uh, 200 grams of substrate. Uh, these metarizium strains that I'm producing are very good. Um, I'm getting um, something like uh, 100 grams to 150 grams of pure spores per kilogram of substrate. Um, anyway, let's uh, go. Okay, so there's several different propagule types. There's the aerial conidium. There is something called the blastospore, which occurs in the insect hemolymph, but also in liquid culture. It's sort of a yeast-like phase with short uh, hyphae produced, which then give rise to more uh, blastospores. There's something, uh, especially with Bovaria, something called a microcycle conidium, which is a conidium that's produced in submerged fermentation. But it's very difficult to obtain large quantities of this. Uh, back in the 1980s, several companies tried as an alternative to solid substrate. Uh, and failed. So the main target, uh, the main tool that we would use is the aerial conidium, which is produced on the surface of the insect, but also on a solid substrate under the right conditions. Then there's something, whoops, there's something called a uh, microsclerotium, which is a very specialized body produced in liquid fermentation. So the, the mycelium aggregates under certain media conditions and in osmotic conditions and forms these pellets, uh, which can be dried and made into a granule. But again, it requires liquid fermentation. Um, um, I and another USDA colleague discovered these and uh, USDA has a patent on, on production of these things. So getting back, the canidium is the one. It's the natural infectious stage. Uh, and it can be easily produced on solid substrate. So that's why when you look at all of the products that are out there, they're almost all produced on solid substrate. So we're going to talk about production of aerial canidia. Very simply, I mean, these fungi have simple taste. Simple carbon, nitrogen source, oxygen, moisture, proper temperature. That's the basics. Uh, they're not fastidious. You can grow them on 
really any cereal grain. You can grow them on, as I will show you, an inert substrate impregnated with liquid medium. There are uh, some basic uh, uh, approaches to doing this. Most typically people use some kind of grain or an organic carrier. And that is maintained in some sort of plastic bag, in a tray, in a chamber. Uh, alternatively, there are some inert carriers, and I will mention those later on, um, that can be impregnated with nutrients. And again, those inert carriers are just like the cereal grains. They're put in bags, in trays, in chambers. They have an advantage in that they can be recycled as opposed to what do you do with 10 tons of spent rice that you use to produce the Bavaria or the Metarizium. Um, you can, with these inert carriers, um, they're based on diatomaceous earth. Um, you can recycle them. Uh, a method was developed by in Eastern Europe back in the 1970s with liquid surface culture. Uh, think of it as a plastic pillow where you have uh, the pillow uh, or if um, those of you who may be famili familiar with what is called a waterbed, a bed that is basically a big plastic pillow with water in it. Um, and you have the fungus growing in that culture inside that plastic bed on the surface of the liquid. And you want to harvest it, you, you cut the plastic, you drain everything, and you have this, this carpet of sporulated mycelium. Uh, it has problems, so it has not really been commercialized. Uh, people have also tried a, some sort of fabric, uh, woven fabric belt impregnated uh, with culture medium. And the fungus grows on this fabric, which can be hung as sheets. Uh, again, when we look at how many spores you produce for a given size or volume, uh, it's not as efficient as solid substrate. So people go with mostly with solid substrate. So first I want to talk about some general and commercial. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, not all fungal strains sporulate well. Um, there's, as a, again, as I mentioned yesterday, there's a tremendous genetic variation. Um, I showed you this slide here. So these are the spore production under, under uh, the same conditions, the same substrate, whereas where you can get the best strains are producing 2.25 times 10 to the 13th canidia per kilogram of substrate. The worst strains are 1 100th of that. Um, this, by the way, is the commercial GHA isolate, which produces about 1 times 10 to the 13th spores per kilogram. Uh, here's another example. These are metarizium isolates, uh, part of a project I conducted in the Azores. We were looking for a good metarizium for uh, combating the Japanese beetle, Papilia japonica, which was an invasive insect into, into the Azores. These are islands in the middle of the Atlantic, for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, they're uh, a part of Portugal, but they're in, right in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and you can see here um, the uh, uh, canidia per kilogram of substrate. Now, metarizium produces a little fewer than bovaria, but you can see some isolates are very good producers. And this particular isolate is a very terrible producer of spores. The other way of looking at it is these numbers here are grams of spores made equivalent to a purity of four times 10 to the 10th canidia per gram. So it gives you a different, a little different perspective on how much fungus uh, each strain or how many spores each strain produces. So this strain here is producing 149 grams of spores containing this many spores per gram uh, per kilogram of substrate. This one here is only five. So this is, so again, there's tremendous genetic variability and you have to evaluate this in parallel with doing the uh, virulence testing. The bottom line, as we say in America, is the cost of fermentation per hectare. 
And that cost of fermentation is per liter of liquid fermentation or per kilogram of substrate. Now, uh, you have to think about it. If you're a small, medium enterprise, you have, to, you have to pay for electricity. You have to pay for, let's say, propane gas to run your autoclaves. You have to pay for salaries. You have to pay rent on the building. All of that goes into uh, the cost of fermentation. Uh, and you can break it down to a kilogram of substrate. Okay. Uh, and then knowing the field efficacy, you have so many spores per hectare. And you're getting so many spores per kilogram of substrate. So if it costs you uh, uh, a one hectare's worth of efficacious fungus uh, in a good fungus would cost you maybe ten dollars a bad fungus a bad spore producer it would cost you twenty five dollars per hectare okay so this is an economic consideration because you don't want to go broke uh, producing fungus for a particular market and so we have this um, we call it a seesaw again the efficacy in spores per hectare in the field not bioassay versus spores per kilogram and this is a, a basic uh, economic consideration that you have to consider and you find you find a compromise so the american strain gha is not the most virulent strain against many insects However, it's a really superior spore producer. So we can produce one times 10 to the 13th spores for less than a dollar. And that means that we can throw, we can use many, many more spores to get in the field to get efficacy. But the economics are still okay, they're still good. And again, yesterday I gave you this example. Uh, in, in screening the fungi, we look at yield versus the virulence. And the ideal is somebody is a strain that's here that is fairly well, fairly virulent, but also producing lots of spores. So this BB1067, uh, this one up here is produces spores like GHA. Um, actually it produces many many more spores sorry uh, but it has the same virulence as gha but it's producing easily twice as many spores so that means uh, a unit of spores is half as expensive okay why so many spores i mean okay so typical uh if you look at the literature uh you look at uh, uh label rates um what you see is 1.25 times 10 to the 12th to 5 times 10 to the 13th spores per hectare in a broadcast application. That's typical. And why so many? You have to look at, okay, so we're using the example of 5 times 10 to the 12th per hectare, you know, broadcast over the field. How that emerges, that, that means with this rate per hectare, you're getting 500 spores per millimeter squared on a flat surface. But a field is not flat. It has foliage. It has a leaf area index, which is some larger amount than the flat hectare. Most foliage is, uh, has a, a leaf area index of four. So that means you're getting 125 spores per millimeter squared if you're spraying this many spores per hectare. If you have a, a dense crop, let's say a, a citrus, a citrus tree five to 10 years old, has a leaf area index of eight, which, which means a hectare of citrus is really eight hectares of surface area that you have to treat. So that means if you're treating at five times 10 to the 12th, you're only getting 62 spores per millimeter squared. Now, how many, how many spores do you need to kill an insect? This is based on a paper by Ray et al. in the Journal of Invertebrate Pathology. I'm a co-author on the paper. Uh, Bovaria strain GHA versus diamondback moth. 
um, I can't remember the Latin name anymore. Um, you rec the LD fifth, the LD or LC ninety five, not fifty ninety five is five hundred and seventy seven spores per millimeter squared. If it's fall army worm, which is pretty resistant to GHA, the LC ninety five is four thousand two hundred. Okay, how does that translate? Five seventy seven per millimeter squared is the equivalent of 2.3 times 10 to the 13th spores per hectare in a crop that has a leaf area index of four. Potatoes, uh, tomatoes, um, cucumbers. Fall armyworm with this kind of LC95, that translates to 1.7 times 10 to the 14th spores per hectare. Okay, and in comparison, the commercial formulation that I helped develop that's still uh, still being uh, sold worldwide, the Tanagard 22 wettable powder has 4.4 times 10 to the 13th spores per kilogram. So how does this boil, boil down to the farmer? So if he's got diamondback moth, he only has to use a half a kilogram per hectare. If he's going after fall armyworm, he needs almost four kilograms per hectare, which is cost prohibitive. Okay, so I think, I hope you're seeing this relationship between how many spores do I need in a field based on its virulence and also application versus how many spores can I produce per unit of fermentation, kilogram of substrate leader of uh, uh, fermentation so again it's cost of fermentation per liter or uh, kilogram per hectare but then you have to consider what is the total needed capacity and capacity is driven by the economics of the market especially in the developing countries but even in your own countries how many hectares of rice um, I saw some statistics for Sri Lanka, for example, and it was, I think, about a couple hundred thousand hectares of rice, so the largest crop, uh, or tea. Um, you know, so how many hectares, especially let's give Sri Lanka a, as an example. If I understand, the Sri Lankan government has decided to uh, eliminate chemical pesticides, which means there's a, a now going to have to be a very heavy reliance on microbial agents as well as other biocontrol agents. And so um, the potential market, the potential size of the uh, needed capacity is several hundred thousand hectares. Okay, now let's look at the system. So here's a comparison of different production methods uh, without spending too much time. Uh, these are published uh, rates, how many spores per unit, um, the, Rus the old Russian Soviet, what they would do is they would grow up the Bovaria or Metarizium in liquid fermentation. They would then pour it into open trays and let it sporulate. Uh, and they would get uh, eight, point, uh, 8 times 10 to the 12th per meter squared. Okay, so what does that mean? For one hectare, which I cannot see. Okay, so the, the application, um, I, on my screen, I have this black bar that covers over the uh, base use rate. It's five times 10 to the 12th per hectare. Okay, so for five times, for one hectare, you have to have this surface area uh, of mycelium. If you're doing the pillow, the check waterbed, uh, one hectare is only 0.05 square meters. With, if you believe their um, stated production rate, which is 10 to the 14th per square meter of surface. Uh, low technology bag solid substrate. So this is the, basically the rice in a plastic bag, uh, which are usually has lower yields. So you need 2.4 kilograms per hectare. Um, engineered by Phasic. Uh, Bovaria, which is a system that was developed by Mycotech, uh, the company uh, with which I worked back in the 1990s. It's a, I'll show you some pictures of that. It's a, it's a half a kilogram per hectare. 
and so on. Okay, so this is this is the kind of considerations when you're looking at what's the best way of doing this. Um, you know, how now? Let's see. Um, okay, so again, following these considerations, let's look at some examples. So this is a U.S. greenhouse market, and let's say you have a very good fungus, and you uh, it's being used on fifty percent of the 18, 000, 7, 7,300 hectares that existed at the time that I, I made this slide up. So you need this many canidia for this amount. How do you produce it? You produce it, um, if you're doing low technology, you need 18,000 18, kilograms of substrate. If you're doing uh, the high engineered, um, uh, mecha uh, mechanized production, you only need 3,600 kilograms. If you're doing liquid fermentation based on this yield, you need 36,400 liters. Okay, now the other consideration is the technology. Solid substrate can be done in a very simple way without high technology. Liquid fermentation means a significant capital investment of liquid fer of fermenters, hundreds of thousands do of dollars, millions of dollars to pre do a system. So there, that's the other consideration. If you're doing sugar beets, beta vulgaris for sugar production, and your fungus is good enough to be used on 30% of the acres, in America, um, there was about 90,000 hectares of sugar beets. At five times 10 to the 12th per hectare, you need this many spores. And this is how much uh, production capacity you need, let's say, over the course of a year. Okay, so this is, again, solid substrate at the, and high efficiency solid sub substrate is the way to go. However, that's also capital intensive, so you have to find a compromise. If you have a smaller market, um, let's say maybe only a portion of the tea market or uh, rice, then you can get along. Or if you're a small cooperative and you are servicing the needs of only about 50 hectares or 100 hectares, then the low technology plastic bag method is ideal. Uh, what I see, for example, in my own experience in Ecuador is a lot of small medium enterprises and they're producing uh, Bovaria Metarhizium trichoderma, but primarily for uh, flower production in greenhouses. So a customer of a small medium enterprise is only 10 hectares, 20 hectares. Or I've seen some farmers uh, actually produce their own Bovaria metarhizium. And uh, one farmer I know is 25 acres of, uh, of um, crucifers. And he was able to produce his own um, fungus because of the small scale. Okay. Uh, I won't go into the other examples. So this is, you know, this is the situation we face in America uh, where we're using, you know, uh, uh, over 200,000 hectares of corn. Uh, okay. So... What does it mean now in terms of uh, solid substrate fermentation versus liquid fermentation? So if you're doing low tech plastic bag method for a 7,000 hectare market, um, you need 18,000 kilograms. If you're doing five, is it 500 grams in a bag, you need uh, this, yeah, this is actually a mistake. This should be, uh, you divide this up by, um, oh, that's right, 36,400 uh, uh, one kilogram bags. The high tech system that Mycotech developed, that we developed at Mycotech, uh, where um, batch size, fermentation size, is um, basically 3640 uh, kilograms. We can do that in four runs. Uh, it's an amazing system. And here it is with liquid fermentation. Okay. Now, how do you go? Do you go high tech 
low uh, labor or you do low tech and high labor well it depends on salaries you know in america salaries are very high so on one hand you have an eight million dollar plant with five people and payroll is three hundred thousand dollars a year if you have low tech and high labor so it's only a two million dollar plant but you have 30 people so all of a sudden your your payroll goes up to 1.8 million dollars on the other hand if the economy of your country is such that you can easily uh, have lots of people working for you then the low tech method and this is what i see let's say in brazil uh, with some of the, the biopesticide producers, or Ecuador, some of the larger companies in Ecuador, uh, where salary is um, uh, very, very reasonable, and uh, you can deal with this. In the United States, you can't. It's impossible uh, to make a, 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 a product that the farmers can afford with like 30, 30 people. Uh, now, one can stay small, simple, again, where your labor is cheap, uh, and the output needs are very, uh, very modest. This is an actual production of uh, Trichoderma and Bovaria uh, for this one company. This, this is internal. This company called Art Roses produces roses primarily for Eastern Europe, and they make their own Bovaria. They make their own Metarizium. And... They use delicatessen cups. They sterilize the cups by exposing them to ultraviolet light. They then have rice inoculated uh, with spores of Bovaria, or Metarizium, or, or Trichoderma. And this is how they produce on sufficient scale for their own operation. Again, it's labor is cheap. At the same time, the, mo the need is modest. Uh, on a medium scale, so this is in Brazil. This is the a former company called Itaforte, which is now owned by Copert. Uh, and you can see the, the, the employees processing bags of, of rice, sterilizing them in this system here. Here they're inoculating them. Uh, this is the fermentation. Looks like a library, except instead of books, you have bags of Bovaria. Um, and this is the uh, some of the raw ingredients. This is the rice that they use for the substrate. So there's the, there's a a, a medium uh, scale, and then there's the high tech scale. This was, and and this is I have to say this is a unique plant. There's only one like this in the world. Um, this is the one what we developed in Mycotech. Um, each one of these fermentation chambers is big enough that you can drive a large truck through the through the chamber. Okay, I can't give you all the details because this is still proprietary. Uh, this is the liquid fermentation that's used to inoculate the 6,000 kilograms of a substrate that is used. Everything is computer controlled. There are multiple sensors inside these chambers. Uh, and so that the humidity and temperature and oxygen content can be controlled inside those chambers. Uh, this entire, this entire uh, factory is run by three people. And this is the result. Um, this is 232 kilograms of canidia with this purity. And this is the sort of total number of canidia from one production run. And to give you an idea of the scale, there's the shovel and a drum. Um, and, and to my knowledge, this, this is the best in the world. But of course, it cost several million dollars to build 30 years ago. Now it's probably would cost 20 million, 30 million dollars easily to build. Okay, let's go to technical uh, uh, considerations. Um, substrates. Uh, there's very di there are many different substrates. Uh, in most cases, in, the, in tropical countries, rice is the most common cereal grain, uh, either whole, whole rice or broken rice. Uh, millet is used in Korea. In, uh, the, in Europe and North America, 
rice is very expensive uh at least a dollar let's see i went to the supermarket today and i was pricing 50 pound bag so it's 20 kilo now well, 20 now i'll call it uh, 22 kilogram bags of rice uh was amounting to a dollar dollar 80 per kilogram i know it's much cheaper in central america for example probably in sri lanka or in thailand or vietnam so what has happened in uh, North America and Europe is flaked barley, oats, or rye. Um, this is actually animal feed, so it's very cheap, 30 cents a kilo. Uh, and it's important that it's, it's flaked. You notice if you see here, see the, 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 the outer coating of the, the cereal is removed and it is mechanically flattened, which makes it very absorbent, which is one of its advantages. Uh, in other countries, cracked corn is used. So again, um, probably in most of Southeast Asia, rice would be the, uh, the, the major cereal uh, crop used as a substrate. One of the things that's a consideration, rice is not all the same. Those of you who do some cooking, uh, using rice. Know that there are different types of rice, long grain, medium grain, short grain. There's also parboiled rice. They all have their cooking characteristics, which means you have to develop your own recipe, if you will. I mean, this is, and the and best analogy I have is this is cooking. And yes, there, you know, uh, let's say to my Vietnamese audience, there's pho, the soup. But there's many different ways to make pho with different flavors and so on. I, I will give you some general guidance during all of this training, and you then have to go and refine it. So one of the things you have to do is, okay, let's find a variety of rice uh, and evaluate it, uh, adjusting the moisture level and so on, and find the, the right conditions, especially the moisture. Because each one of these, these rice uh, varieties has different cooking properties. You don't want a wet um, agglomeration of rice because the fungus won't grow very well. Um, there's all sorts of alternative sources. If you look at the literature, um, I, uh, I, I uh, evaluated worldwide a production of fungi uh, back in what was it 2010 for a book chapter that uh, that revision is um, uh, being made now. It's a book on mass production of beneficial organisms. I'm doing a chapter on the fungi, state of the art, um, and so I'm updating some of this. But you can see some of the substrates that people have tried: rice husks, broken rice, chickpea, agricultural byproducts, uh, sugarcane bagasse with dextrose, wheat bran, and so on and so on. There's a constant effort to try to find cheaper substrates, especially waste substrates. Um, obviously, if you're using, you know, you want to use rice as a substrate, you're taking it out of the mouths of people. And so there's a, you know, a conflict there, if you will. Um, and, but the problem with most of these substrates, uh, such as sugarcane bagasse, uh, groundnut cake, coconut cake, neem cake, or sesame cake, the spore production is usually very poor compared to a good cereal grain. Um, so, substrate preparation. Again, these are just recipes, and we will be doing, I, in the videos that I'm hoping to prepare in the next few months, we will be demonstrating some of this, and then with the on-site training, inshallah, um, we, uh, you will have a chance to actually do some of this and, and get a feeling for cooking this. So rice, let's say we take 300 gram, grams of rice. Uh, typically it's cooked in water for at 70 C for 20 minutes or just simply soaked for four to six hours. Then it's pulled out, drained on a cloth for 20 minutes and then transferred the 300 grams of wet rice into plastic bags. And then it's sterilized. Okay, and then of course cooled before inoculating. Um, I got impatient 
And I came up with another recipe, which is you take and add um, 500 mils of hot water uh, per kilogram of dry rice. You microwave it for five to 10 minutes. And this is feasible on a large scale. I've seen microwaves that are as big as a desk. Uh, and then you stir, so that the microwaving then hydrates the rice to the right extent. And then you sterilize it. Uh, and of course, cool before inoculating. Uh, the Koreans have, a, and this is commercial, uh, have a, they use millet. Uh, you, one could also use sorghum. Now, uh, this millet or sorghum has the outer um, layers removed. So it can absorb the water. Um, ideally, it could be even flattened, mechanically flattened and broken. Uh, but in Korea, they use just the, the well, I guess you'd call it culinary millet. So you add, uh, let's see, four mils of 50% citric acid to, uh, into a liter of water. You add 500 mils to a kilogram of millet. You cook it uh, for uh, one hour, or you can microwave it if you're impatient. You let it sit five to 10 minutes to finish absorbing the liquid, and then you go ahead and autoclave. The advantage of millet, if those of you who are familiar with it, think about the size and shape. It's an ideal granule for use in soil as well as producing spores that can be removed and put into a formulation. And this is what the, uh, there's a Korean company called Farm Hanong uh, that is producing Bovaria on millet to control thrips in the plastic houses where the Koreans produce the uh, leafy vegetables because the thrips uh, pupate in the soil. So the tactic then is to take this millet on which Bovaria has grown and put it into the soil. The Bovaria has colonized the millet and it grows out and resporulates. And now all of a sudden you have this big anti-tank landmine, if you will. Uh, and so the thrips would come in, contact it, pick up a lethal dose. And it's quite efficacious. And there, uh, this company is producing hundreds of tons of, of Bovaria uh, millet uh, in this manner. Uh, again, barley for North America, for Europe, it's cheaper, but it's also really nice, uh, it's convenient because all you do is you add water, mix, and autoclave. Very simple. Uh, cracked maize also works well. It just add water, mix, let it sit for a little bit so the, the moisture is absorbed, and you then loosely close the bag and you uh, autoclave. This is one of the inert substrates. You can see a picture here. This is diatomaceous earth. Uh, it's um, ava readily available in, in the United States and Europe. Yeah, I really don't know about Southeast Asia, but it's, it's used to absorb spilled oil or spilled chemicals. And it's, uh, you can see the texture of it um, here's a sieve analysis. Um, so pretty much all of it is um, larger than a 20 mesh, which is uh, a couple millimeters in size. This absorbs. So what you do is you put a liquid medium uh, on this and then inoculate. Actually, you inoculate the liquid medium uh, with... Uh, liquid culture of Bovaria metarizium, and then use that to uh, absor be absorbed by the inert substrate, and then put it in some sort of container, plastic bag or, or whatever. Uh, in the 1980s at Abbott Laboratories, the multinational where I worked, was this was the system we developed. Um, the nice thing about it is it can be recycled. Again, it's a high technology uh, factory. So the, the, subs, the, the Bovaria is removed from this floor dry uh, by certain methods, and then the, the residue is sterilized by something called countercurrent heat exchange, rehydrated, re-inoculated, and put back in the containers. 
and so there's no almost no waste stream. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, this whole process never uh, really was commercialized because of business reasons. Um, and also, this was a, a joint venture we had with the Soviet Union. And at that time, the, the, uh, the changes in the fall of the Soviet Union ended a lot of these enterprises. So this, this whole process was dead. But this potential still exists. Another one is a... Um, something called uh, a horticulture grade high fired calcine clay, which is used in potting media. Again, this is like that diatomaceous earth. There is a company in Europe that's producing Bavaria uh, using this sort of substance. And again, it absorbs the liquid medium, which you can then tailor. So for example, I had a Russian Bavaria in the 1980s, and the only thing it liked was sorbitol and ammonium nitrate. Uh, it didn't like glucose. It didn't like fructose or sucrose. Uh, so it was uh, trying to find a good medium for it. Um, we then used this diatomaceous earth, what I showed you before, this stuff, and we, we had a medium of sorbitol, ammonium nitrate, a few other other salts, and we could produce the, the Russian Bavaria. Uh, this is another vor version. This is produced in Germany for potting media. Again, it's it's basically an absorb uh, a uh, 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 absorbent, uh, and you use liquid media. Uh, there's all sorts of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, disadvantage is you do get a slower, a lower, slightly lower ye uh, lower yield than of grain, uh, and then sometimes. You need to use water to harvest the spores, and then you have to concentrate the spores. And so then you need a continuous flow centrifugation. Again, money, which is probably not feasible for small, medium enterprises, um, but, uh, but rather more for larger, uh, a larger enterprise with good capitalization. Okay, sterilization. Uh, this is how the Brazilian company sterilizes its bags of rice with a series of autoclaves. Now, the mistake they're making is they're packing the bags of rice uh, too closely together. Uh, if you uh, research the, the physics of sterilis steam sterilization, uh, you know, you will learn that you, the steam has to be go going around all, the, all of the containers. Uh, and so you need some spacing. If you pack it like this, what happens is in the center, it never heats up uh, sufficiently to sterilize the material. Um, the other thing is the duration. Those of you who uh, do microbiology, you're probably familiar with the standard time, and, uh, time uh, temperature and pressure, the time being 25 minutes. Well, that's really valid only for small volumes, 100 milliliters, maybe 200 milliliters, because the liquid or the solid substrate in a bag is a certain mass, and it takes time for the steam to reach it and to heat it to a sterilization temperature. And so here's a, a, a very evocative chart. So this is the chamber temperature inside the autoclave. Okay, so it heats up very rapidly. Uh, if you're doing 250 mils of auger, that I have to move this up. Uh, that auger does not reach a sterilization temperature until nine minutes into the cycle. If you're doing 400 mils of water or auger or substrate, 400 uh, grams of su wet substrate, your sterilization temperature is not reached for at least 12, 13 minutes. And if you're doing larger bags, like for example, one kilogram of substrate in a bag, your sterilization temperature, it takes over 25 minutes to reach that sterilization. And then you need to have a dwell time of 25 minutes. So what does that mean? If you're dealing with 500 grams in a bag, a kilogram in a bag, you have to sterilize 
for more than the normal time. You have to sterilize for 40 minutes, 50 minutes. Uh, when I was doing two kilograms in large bags that I will show you, I was sterilizing for 70 minutes in a normal autoclave. Okay. So this is an important consideration. Uh, one of the biggest problems I see, let's say in Ecuador, um, actually, uh, the reason I'm producing some metarizium uh, for a company right now is they were making mistakes on uh, insufficient sterilization when I trouble when I look to see how they were doing things. Um, so you have to sterilize long enough and uh, the rule of thumb is right there. So the volume of liquid or substrate moistened substrate think of it as liquid is on the left side and there's your sterilization time. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, I know in America, they don't teach this to microbiologists. Everybody just thinks 25 minutes. No, no. Okay. So, um, so you want to pack the bags. So, uh, again, this is commercial operation with rice in plastic bags. You need to have the, 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 the steam to go around the bags to heat them up. So this is a, a more appropriate arrangement of, of the bags. Uh, now, there's an alternative. Because obviously, if uh, you, you're steam sterilizing, it requires a lot of energy, either electricity or propane to operate the, the burner for the, for the stove. So there's a process that you can try, which is called tindalization. You moisten the substrate, you heat it to 70 C for 30 minutes of dwell time. Then you cool it and you let it sit overnight for 24 hours at room temperature. What that does is the first, the first heating kills the vegetative cells. It, uh, then when it comes down to room temperature, the various spore formers start germinating. So then you did it, do it again, 70 C for 30 minutes. You kill those cells that are germinating, fungi, fungi, bacilli, whatever. Okay. And then you do it a third time. And that uh, combined with a heavy inoculum of Bovaria metarizium uh, can usually suffice. And you're using less energy. You're spending less money on the sterilization of your substrate. Uh, there's some high technology systems. Um, the one in the upper left is, is a system that is actually used uh, in the company that, uh, that I had. Um, it's a continuous steam, it's a, uh, aseptic processing system was developed for steam sterilizing foods. Uh, another version is down here. Uh, is a, think of this as a, a conveyor belt and the, the, the material is not in the bags, but the loose material is passes through, is steamed, is heated, um, and then at the end, it's dispensed into uh, clean, sterile bags. Uh, this is really high technology for very high uh, production. This is actually a Chinese V-cone blender that's used for mushroom spawn inoculation. Uh, it, the technology was actually developed by an American company and patented about 30 years ago. And the patent, of course, is gone, and the Chinese are making this thing. Um, this, this unit here is, is uh, five meters high. And you can load it up. You can sterilize your substrate. Um, then you can then cool it because it's water jacketed. And you then you can inoculate it. And the, the, the V-cone blender mixes everything. At the bottom is a special door uh, which can be connected up to a sterile chute or, or, or duct. And uh, there's a, uh, an American company uh, that produces a mushroom spawn for, uh, for most of the mushroom production in the United States. So they have a system going where they can aseptically transfer, excuse me, my cat is, um, wants to come in and say a few words. Um, uh, 
uh, it uh, dispenses uh, the sterilized inoculated substrate into five kilogram bags, almost like pillows, if you will. And that is how they produce the Garica spawn. Uh, one can produce Bovaria this way. Um, another way of sterilizing, uh, which is actually used in West Germany, is to use cobalt-60 radiation. Uh, it's a system used for um, uh, uh, food sterilization. Um, obviously, it's only for large-scale production, for very well-capitalized uh, systems. I just wanted to give you an idea of, of sort of the potential for large-scale mass production. Not that it may be very practical for you, but this is how some of, some people are doing it. So it gives you ideas. Containers. So there's the simplest little plastic delicatessen cup. This is used in Ecuador. Again, small scale production. Uh, the uh, the cups. Uh, one company that I, I visited, they discovered that uh, fresh cups right from the packing case are almost sterile and just a brief irradiation with some UV of a UV lamp is sufficient to finish off the sterilization and, and make them usable. Again, the rice is inoculated with, uh, actually in this case, uh, uh, spores, just aerial canidia from an auger culture. Uh, most commonly is some sort of plastic bag. Uh, just closed over typically 100 grams or 200 grams of rice inoculated um, and um, as you can see here the bag is just simply closed with three staples uh, there's a, a potential problem in that these fungi need gas exchange and you can choke the fungus so if you seal this bag tightly the fungus will choke and won't sporulate. Uh, there you can make all sorts of containers. This is a, a, a container, again, not maybe not so much for, pers uh, for uh, commercial production, but in the Caucasus in Armenia and Georgia, I had a project and we were sourcing uh, materials. So you take a, a high density um, polyethylene bag such as these little autoclave bags. Uh, in Latin America, they use uh, baking bags that you buy for, for uh, the kitchen, home kitchen, in, in which you can bake things. Um, you can also use the plastic shopping bags. Those are all high density polyethylene and they withstand autoclaving. Uh, in this kind of model, we took PVC um, pipe joints so this little sleeve joins two PVC pipes for house plumbing. And so we made a flask uh, with a neck and a foam plug. And here you see this, op this is all metarhizium growing in here. And, the, and the, you get a good gas exchange through this, this plug. You, you can use foam, you can use cotton. Uh, again, this is the Brazilian method. You can see their sterilization techniques. It's simply a, a, a propane stove with uh, pressure canners. And here they're just producing the sterile bags of rice. These are inoculated. And then this is the incubation room. Uh, now, there are um, all sorts of bags for mushroom production that have a vent. Uh, this one here is produced in Europe. It's called the micro sac or sac O2. These are all uh, vents that allow for gas exchange but restrict moisture loss. This is an American bag with a big uh, tieback patch. These are smaller bags that you can buy off Amazon um, for mushroom production. It's all for hobby mushroom production. Um, these bags here, some of the bags will easily hold a kilo of substrate. Uh, and then you use a heat sealer after you you um, uh, inoculate the substrate with liquid culture, which is my ideal, uh, you then heat seal it. Um, again, so these, these filters are, are basically 0 0.2, 0 0.5 microns. 
and they again they keep out the microorganisms they retain more water in the substrate but they allow gas exchange which is very very important uh, this is the the larger SACO 2 kilogram one to three kilogram capacity unfortunately the sacks are not cheap they're probably I think a dollar something a piece um, so it's probably not the, the most feasible for uh, a simple small medium enterprises that is not well capitalized uh, this is this is this is my production in USDA so this is two kilograms of the barley with metarizium growing and you can see the fantastic sporulation this was a good strain and this is how I was incubating each one of these bags contains uh, two kilograms of substrate I'm producing this for some field trials um, and again uh, you see this powder here that's all that's all canidia so this this is a, a superb um, strain for spore production uh, you it is possible to use aluminum trays um, for 100 to 300 grams of, of substrate so this is on um, autoclave barley uh, these trays we buy in the United States they're, they're for making cakes um, and ostensibly they're um, disposable but I, I use them again and again and they're very cheap and they have a cardboard lid so you you have the um, the substrate is sterilized in a bag it's inoculated in the bag mixed and then in a in a laminar flow hood then transferred into the tray and the, um, the, the depth of the bed can't really exceed about three centimeters. Uh, and then you put the lid, the lid is, is, is sterilized with um, alcohol and, and then let sit for 10, 15 minutes in the laminar flow hood then so that surface becomes sterile. This is the result. So this is another type of tray, a little larger, but you see this metarizium and you can see how well sporulated it is. And so here's this the cheap tray uh, with the Bovaria very nicely sporulated. So this is a, another option. Um, and again, uh, you can make, you can get better trays and use them again and again and again. Um, this may seem very strange to you. Uh, this is a very interesting, it's a high density polyethylene uh, container that's used for uh, silverware and things like that in cafeterias. It's autoclavable and you can produce and, and a company uses these. They, each one of these holds three kilograms of barley. Um, the, uh, the tray is autoclaved separately. The barley is in a bag, properly autoclaved, inoculated with liquid culture, and then in a laminar flow hood uh, is, is poured into this tray. Now, for, for uh, fermentation, the bottom of the tray has a, a, a mesh screen so that the rice or the barley doesn't fall through uh, the bottom of the tray. And this is nice because it allows very, very good aeration. And so then after inoculation, this tray is put back into the large plastic bag in which it was autoclaved okay, and incubated that way for about 72 hours which allows the Bovaria or the metarizium to thoroughly colonize the substrate. At that point, the bag can be removed, but the incubation chamber still maintains high humidity. That's, that's uh, essential. But you don't have to have the thing in the bag, so that the fungus just has colonized all the, all the rice in 72 hours and then begins to spoilate. So this is another system, and a company uses this. Um, you can take this sort of thing, and uh, this is from a, a, a Ye et al. Bio a biotechnology letters, uh, basically a whole series of trays inside a, um, a chamber. Um, air is brought into the bottom of the chamber, allowed to pass through and out. The air is, of course, humidified, um, and you can get trays. Each tray has several kilograms of, of substrate. Uh, this is an adaptation. I mean, this is a commercial piece of equipment that's used for uh, uh, dehydrating foods, but you can, you can adapt it to use for uh, a, a fermentation chamber. 
Um, this is a system that's used by Bayer in Germany to produce um, uh, several different fungi, Coniotherium minitans, which is a biofungicide, uh, Bavaria, Pisilomyces, Lelacinus. Uh, it's a series of beds. As you see the, diag di the diagram here, they are uh, made into a large um, package and you can see the size of it. This, this is an autoclave uh, and also they have similar chambers for incubation. And so the fungus is grown inside this. The key thing here is air is sterile air, uh, run, sterilized air, sterile, sterilized by filtration, enters underneath each bed, passes through the substrate, allowing for very good gas exchange. And so then you get optimal spore production. Again, high technology, lots of money, high capitalization, but buyer can afford this. So this is how they're producing their fungi. Um, another system, again, to give you an idea of what can be done, not necessarily what you need to do, uh, is uh, conversion of these uh, containers, the shipping containers, into fermentation chambers. And here what you have is a series of shells, which are not rigid, but rather the, the shelf is like a, a mesh um, cloth on which the substrate is placed. It can be loaded aseptically, and you get many of these layers. And then when it comes time to harvest, uh, the other end opens up, and each layer is moved out of the container into a what's called a delumper, which breaks up the substrate into smaller pieces, which then can be dried and then harvested. Uh, but you can also be simple. I mean, here's, here's the one, one of the small medium enterprises in, um, in Ecuador. And they're commercially very successful. Again, small, uh, small operation, uh, dedicated customers. Uh, think of it as more as a cooperative level as opposed to a, a national company but it can be done. Okay, inoculation of substrates. There's several different ways to inoculate substrates. You can, um, you can grow it on Petri dishes, on auger, cut them up and take pieces and throw them into uh, the plastic bag with the sterilized rice. This takes time to colonize. And so there's always a danger that contaminants will uh, outrace the Bavaria or the Metarizium, and what you end up is a bag full of penicillium or aspergillus. Uh, you can take the spores off the agar culture and suspend them up aseptically in sterile, let's say, tween 80, and use that to inoculate the substrate. It's, it's a perfectly feasible system. The disadvantage is that it takes 24 hours for the spores to germinate and to begin growing. Uh, if there's any contamination, it can potentially uh, outpace the Bavaria or the Metarizium. And what you end up getting is uh, a culture that's uh, contaminated with yeast or with bacteria. Uh, and you, your spore production is not only lower, but it's also contaminated with those microorganisms, which may actually be dangerous for humans. Uh, the preferred method is to create a liquid broth. Uh, by inoculating it with spores from an agar culture. You don't need very many spores, uh, one or two loops. You then uh, run some sort of liquid fermentation, and then you use that to inoculate the substrate. And this is what is used by, uh, by many of the companies that, that I've visited. Um, pluses and minuses, I'm not going to go through this. You can read for yourself. Uh, liquid culture media, there are many different recipes. Uh, the, in general, you use glucose, dextrose, sucrose, 20 to 30 grams per liter, yeast extract, 20 to 30 grams per liter. Some recipes call for corn steep liquor, uh, which is a byproduct of uh, corn fermentation. Um, you don't necessarily need it. Uh, and then you, you should use some sort of antibiotic. I find chloramphenicol is, is one of the better ones. 
uh, it's, it can be autoclaved so that you can add the chloramphenicol into the liquid medium and then autoclave the liquid medium without the antibiotic losing strength. Penicillium uh, uh, does not stand autoclaving and it really is only good for um, maybe 24, 48 hours. And then it, the, the penicillin loses its uh, potency against most bacteria. Uh, streptomycin is better, but streptomycin only works against certain kinds of bacteria. So chloramphenicol is a nice general antibiotic, I mean, yeah, to use. Bovaria, different medium. Um, a good culture medium, especially to get lots of blastospores. Now, I will say why in a few minutes. It's simply uh, 20 grams per liter of glucose dextrose sucrose, but only one gram of yeast extract. So you have a, a high carbon nitrogen ratio. And also you're throwing in a lot of inorganic nitrogen which is the key for blastospore production in Bavaria. And of course, some uh, uh, dihydrogen uh, phosphate, potassium phosphate. Uh, and that part of that is for pH maintenance and then the antibiotic. Uh, this is an excellent medium for, uh, uh, for Bavaria, but also for the uh, Isaria cordyceps uh, fungi. Uh, there's all sorts of containers. I mean, you can get fancy with shaker tables uh, on, a lower, on a simpler scale. Really, all you need is a magnetic uh, um, mixing bar and a turntable and do it this way. Um, very small scale. It's, I do this, which is a Wheaton bottle with liquid medium. Again, a little magnetic bar in the bottom. And then all of this fits inside an incubator. Uh, you can also use uh, a bubbler where you take air from an aquarium pump, run it through a filter, and let it bubble through the liquid medium providing the oxygen that way. Uh, for larger scale, you can use these, these uh, bubblers. Uh, here's a expensive uh, scientific flasks. You can also use these carboys. Um, if you can make beer, you can make liquid inoculum. Um, so it's a four to 20 liter uh, carboy um, with a, ideally a magnetic stirrer in the bottom. Uh, you fit it out for uh, being able to introduce oxygen and so on. Uh, this is something off Amazon. It's actually for a uh, for making beer, and it actually has a spigot uh, to which you could attach a repeating syringe to inoculate the bags of substrate aseptically. Uh, typically, we use 10 10% uh, volume to weight inoculum to substrate. So in other words, uh, 10, 10 milliliters of liquid inoculum for every 100 grams of substrate. So if you've got 40 kilograms of substrate, you only need four liters of liquid inoculum. And to get that four liters of inoculum, all you need is not even one Petri plate of agriculture, okay? Uh, all you need is just a few scrapings with an inoculating loop. And then the fungus multiplies in the liquid culture, magnifying the, the amount of the inoculum. It's much more efficient than scraping spores off of the plate. Uh, again, if you, can make, if you can make beer, you can prepare liquid inoculum. Uh, this is a system I had uh, for making uh, 20 liters of inoculum. Um, again, it's, it's designed from the beer making, uh, home uh, beer making industry. Um, in some cases, the temperature is low. You can buy these thermal jackets that wrap around the 20 liter carboy um, and they have a, a, a temperature sensor and you can control the temperature of your fermentation in case your, your room is too cold. Like uh, my basement laboratory in the winter time, I'm running 16 to 17 centigrade. It's a little cold for uh, fermenting fungi. So I have to use something like this. Uh, here's an actual operation. This is again out of Ecuador. Uh, these are um, uh, uh, 20 liter carboys hooked up to uh, aquarium pumps. Each one has a filter so that the air goes in and vigorously bubbles um, oxygen and it's it, it then evacuated through a, a, a filter plugged uh, exit port. 
And so this is how the company is producing its liquid inoculum for inoculating rice with bovaria, with trichoderma, with metarizium. Um, now, what you want, regardless of the system, what you want is a nice uh, soup, if you will. You see the texture? It's, uh, you don't want uh, balls of fungus or a, something that looks like a, a, a applesauce uh, because that does not distribute well through a substrate, especially if you're injecting it. Uh, like you saw with the syringe. Uh, you want something like this. Uh, those media that I mentioned will give you that with the right amount of aeration and the right amount of agitation. Um, this is what it looks like microscopically. Um, this is a, a metarizium, right? Yeah. Uh, metarizium blastospores. These are bovaria blastospores. Um, you want a, a, in, the, in your inoculum, ideally somewhere around 5 million to 50 million uh, blastospores per milliliter. Um, again, you're inoculating a 10% volume to mass. The, over this particular range of concentrations, it doesn't really affect the yield. If you drop below 5 million per milliliter, it will take longer for the fungus to really achieve its true yield potential. So you may have to, incub you may have to incubate your solid substrate for, for four weeks instead of 10 days or 14 days. This is what you do not want, is lots of mycelium. Because again, when you add it to the substrate, it does not distribute very well. So A, it takes longer to colonize all of the substrate. And also, if there is any trace contamination in one corner of the substrate, it, that contamination will have a chance to establish itself because the fungus inoculation hasn't reached it, hasn't been distributed well. So you do, do not want this. Uh, how do you check for possible contamination? This is the quality control during fermentation. Uh, one way to do it is to look at, if you're looking at for liquid culture contamination, at about 24, 36 hours of liquid fermentation, you take samples aseptically and you plate them on uh, either plate count auger or nutrient auger, which in, tends to inhibit fungal growth, but allows bacteria to grow, especially at 35, 36 Celsius. Then, uh, if you want, and then to check for fungi, you take potato dextrose auger plus some antibiotics to block the bacteria. And again, you incubate at 35, 36. Why 35, 36? Because that temperature it greatly inhibits, if not stops, bovaria, metarizium, cordyceps from growing. It does not stop aspergillus or penicillium or some of the typical saprophytic fungi. And they grow very, very fast. And so you, you make these plates, you incubate them, and you check them after 48 hours. Uh, if you see any growth, you can check it microscopically, but if you see any growth, it's a contaminant. So that means your liquid um, uh, culture is, is contaminated and you need to begin again. Uh, how do you check for improper sterilization of the substrate? One way to do it is prepare your substrate, for example, in the bags, one week ahead of time, and then just let them sit. And if there's any contamination, especially aspergillus, penicillium, you're gonna see it. And so you're not wasting uh, your fermentation on a bad bag. Uh, this is a schematic that I use in my own particular lab using what I just described. Uh, so you have some sort of flask culture at 36, 48 hours, you inoculate nutrient auger or PCA, and then PDA plus chloramphenicol, incubate at 35, 36 C, and see if there's any bacteria or aspergillus. And then you go on, and you've got, this is uh, my, my recipe, my formula for the solid substrate. And then, the, and then if these are clean, that liquid inoculum, which can be, if it's really finished by 
72 hours, for example, you can refrigerate it. Okay, and then pull it from the refrigerator if it's clean, and then use that to inoculate the solid substrate. Okay. Uh, different methods. You can uh, pour the, the substrate. Um, this, this, this particular thing was we were doing two, teal, uh, two kilograms of barley in the bag, so we knew we needed uh, 200 milliliters of liquid culture, which was one flask. So it was very easy um, to, to make the inoculum one flask for one bag and do it this way. Now, on mass production, you can use a uh, repeating syringe uh, and inoculate the substrate this way aseptically. Uh, I've also seen, again, in a laminar flow hood, a, uh, you have your liquid inoculum in its container and you hook it up with a, uh, just a regular dispenser. Uh, one, in one case, it was actuated with a foot pedal. And so the, the, the lady was sitting there, this, is, this was her job all day, Lo inoculate bags of rice, bring in the rice, boom, one after the other. Okay, so there's different ways of inoculating. Uh, fermentation conditions. What you want is 60% moisture content after inoculation. So in other words, you hydrate the substrate, rice, barley, corn, to 50%. And then you're adding 10% volume to weight inoculum. So the, the total moisture content is 60%. And it can be vary a little bit, but 70% uh, is probably too moist. Uh, 50, 45 percent moisture uh, probably will inhibit sporulation. But this is something that you have to try with, with whatever strain you're, you're, you're uh, starting to commercialize and you want to optimize production. Uh, these are the temperature. Uh, and one company actually incubates its Bavaria at 20 centigrade, which uh, doesn't affect the Bavaria, but it slows any potential contamination. So the Bavaria outcompetes the contaminants. Um, dark incubation is okay. Uh, in my experience, light does not have a, an effect, even though you see some uh, papers in the scientific literature saying, oh, if you eliminate the cultures, you get better spore production. Uh, frankly, on solid, those papers are based on agar medium. On solid substrate, I have not seen this. You can incubate in the dark. The big thing is you need good carbon dioxide oxygen exchange some, through some manner, whether it's a vent or a loosely uh, stoppered uh, uh, neck of the bag, uh, whatever. You do not want to seal the bag. You also need to have good heat transfer, which means you, have, you cannot have a big mass of solid substrate fermentation because it's a compost pile. It generates metabolic heat. And if you have a mass that is maybe 10, 15 centimeters in diameter, the center will actually hit 40 centigrade and kill the fungus. And so you don't get good growth in the center, only on the, on the outside. So in the case of the bags, as I showed you the one picture, uh, there. So you see these bags. They're, they're no more than about seven centimeters in depth. If you go with trays like this, same thing. You don't want to go more than five or seven centimeters. Uh, same thing with this. You do higher, if, you, if the, your bed is thicker, the center will overheat and you will get lower spore production. Okay. Um, how long do you how long do you do your fermentation? Typically seven to ten days with a good spore producer. Uh, spore production really follows a sigmoid curve. Uh, you see in the literature people uh, incubating for fourteen days, twenty one days, twenty eight days. Uh, I think seven to ten days uh, is sufficient. Excuse me. <sighs> Um, and uh, a few metarhizium require 14 days, you know, and so you're here. There's some discussion about young versus old canidia. So young canidia being canidia that are produced here, 
and the fermentation is terminated by drying versus old canidia that are have had uh, aged um, and that's not been completely resolved there's some one paper that which is again using auger cultures which is a little bit different uh, indicated that there was a different in uh, difference in pathogenicity where the young spores were more pathogenic for aphids than the old spores um, I have run some crude experiments using solid substrate and I do not see any difference in um, uh, pathogenicity between young spores and old spores. Processing. Okay, it all depends on how you want to use the fungus. If you're doing small scale experimental, you can simply take that solid Dr. substrate. Stefan, can you yes. Can you yeah, yes. so it's, it's 12 30 Ooh, yes. midnight for you so i wanted to know uh, our plans will we have one more lecture so do you think we can do it today or, or have it i would like to try i would like to try to finish it It'd be another 20 minutes is okay. that is that agreeable for the audience yeah, uh, i was just asking because you know it, it's 12 30 for you so well you i'm i'm i i had my coffee i'm wide awake okay sure <laughs> sure please uh, please go okay on. so yeah um, you know, again, um, you know, you can see from the handouts, you can read for yourself, but uh, depending on how you want to use the fungus, you have different options, all the way from using it right away, giving it to the farmer right away. You can even give it to the farmer as a wet culture, still in the plastic bag. Hopefully the same amount of, of, of spore production in all your plastic bags. And then the farmer then takes that, puts that into a 20 liter uh, bucket with some tween and water, stirs it up, filters it uh, either through some fine mesh or um, uh, I have actually used ladies pantyhose as a very nice filter. Um, and, or you go all the way to a large scale commercial use where you have to dry the, the, the culture, harvest it to get the dry spores and formulate it and store it. Okay, and this, this, this is the commercial use that you see in the developed world. Uh, I have seen in Ecuador, I have seen both the small uh, package distribute the wet culture, and I have seen uh, uh, several companies actually dry the Bovaria on the substrate in the open, they open up the plastic bag, they let it dry in a, in a drying room, then they package it all up and they sell it to the farmer with some tween and the farmer suspends filters and sprays and the the product is used within one or two weeks and it's done on a demand basis so the the, the companies actually it's sort of like delivering milk uh, one company goes out every friday in their trucks and delivers bovaria and trichoderma to the the, the customer farmers okay drying um in general, you want to dry in two to four days. So here's some examples of, of trays. The easiest way, one way, is simply to take air and pass it over. This is how I do in my basement. Please ignore my wine collection. Um, and so here I have a window fan running on low speed. And it actually, the, the spores are not really dislodged from the substrate as they dry because the uh, the substrate is below the edge of the tray. So the air passes over, but does not dislodge the spores. And you monitor um, by a weight change. So again, uh, four centimeters ideal is about two centimeters. Uh, you can do it, you can take the fermentation and do it in bags, and then carefully with a, a HEPA um, a cleaner, a room air cleaner, sucking like a fume hood, you can transfer the culture very carefully into the trays for drying. So that's how I do this. Uh, you can also, if contamination is a problem, uh, you can take the paper bags that you have in the markets. I assume in Southeast Asia, you, they still have the paper bags. These are the heavy craft paper bags and you make a tent. Each one of these holds a kilogram of, of culture. Um, and then you have a, a dry environment and you let the things dry. This takes a little longer. This takes maybe five to six days, which is okay. 
but it, it, at least the spores are contained. Uh, this is a typical drying curve. Um, so open tray. So this is the gross weight uh, in the in the in the either tray or in the paper bag, and you can see the speed. And you just want to dry the culture down to where it's starting to the weight is starting to stabilize. So from here on, you can you can then harvest the spores. With the paper bag, again, you can see it takes longer. But here on say day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, I could harvest the spores. And this this drying. The conditions were 22 Celsius, 45% relative humidity. So I have in my basement right now, I have a dehumidifier. And that keeps the humidity at 45, 50%, which is enough to, I guess, dry the spores down enough so that you can harvest them. And then you have to dry them further for a good shelf life, if that's what you want. Uh, again, another system uh, for... Uh, drying this is basically a dehumidifier where the air moves in here it comes up and moves slowly up through a, a layer of canidia powder or uh, a substrate and is, is vacated and this can be made out of big plastic boxes uh, bins and totes uh, here's a more um, uh, detailed schematic again um, this is both for fermentation and for drying so depending, you can control the moisture of the air. So during the fermentation, the air is at uh, almost saturation, 100% relative humidity uh, to maintain the fungus. But then when it comes to dry, you switch to dry air and the air passes over these beds of fungus and quickly dries them. Uh, this is an adapt, uh, adaptation from a commercial a shelf dryer that's used for baked goods. Um, and again, you can see the substrate on trays uh, for drying. Now, measuring moisture content. You want to dry these spores down. Uh, there's two ways to measure moisture. Gravimetric, uh, which is percent moisture. Uh, typically, these meters, you can buy them on Amazon. For, they're all made in China, uh, 600 to $1,200. There's another alternative uh, measurement. It's called water activity, which is the amount of available water in a substance. And it's on a scale of zero to one, which is really equivalent from 0% to 100% humidity. Because in a sense, that's how the, the water activity is measured, the humidity of the air above the samples. This is a little handheld meter that I have um, at $600 off Amazon. Um, it's used for uh, dry foods, measuring the moisture of dry foods. Again, you put the sample uh, in this in a cup here. You attach it, it. You attach this to that. You then turn it on, and it gives you. In this case, this sample is a water activity of 0.35. Now, final moisture. You need ideally, if you're going to store these spores for any period of time. You need to reduce the moisture down to seven to nine percent moisture on a gravimetric basis, which is a water activity of 0.2 to 0.35. I I tend to work on water activities because it's a biologically meaningful uh, thing. This is uh, out of Faria et al. There's the citation where they uh, uh, took moisture content and water activity for Bovaria, Metarizium, and then the, the locust active Metarizium, Metarizium critum. And you can see, so for about 7% moisture, you're down to 0 0.3, 0 0.25 water activity units. And that's what you need for, for um, a long-term shelf life of these spores. Now, how do you do that if your spores, if you're, you're drying it to 45% humidity? Well, you harvest the spores, and then you put them in bowls in a chamber and, and, and add uh, containers of uh, uh, silica desiccant uh, and, uh, take, and then incubate for a couple of days. And that silica will draw the, the moisture uh, out of the spores and bring them down to a, a satisfactory moisture level. And this is what I do in, in my lab here. I have some plastic, uh, they call them totes, that can be sealed. And I and with the little shelves inside, and I put the containers of spores that I harvested in there, 
and I have bowls of this. Uh, actually, it's indicating um, a desiccant. Um, and I will be showing all of this on my videos. So uh, you'll, you'll get this chance. So um, harvest. Uh, my little thing here in production as in home finance. It's not how much salary you make. It's how much you keep at the end of the month. Uh, there are various ways of harvesting the spores. And again, dry cultures. Uh, one way is to use vibratory sieves. And this is an operation uh, that we set up in Azores uh, for uh, harvesting uh, metarizium. And you can see the worker uh, with the dry culture, metarizium culture. Uh, and um, this is the resulting uh, spores. So this, these, uh, these uh, mechanical um, vibratory sieves, they basically ab abrade the, um, the substrate, the sporulated substrate. Uh, sometimes it helps to put in either ceramic beads or children's glass marbles or even metal, um, uh, what they call it, nuts, you know, the nuts and bolts, so the nut, a whole series of those to act at, as physical abrasion and the spores then drop down um, a 20 mesh sieve so that the substrates on a 20 mesh sieve below that is a 100 mesh or an 80 mesh sieve the spores are collected in uh, this particular container here so here's a one stack and here's a second st stack uh, by the way you notice she's wearing a mask um, it's really important when working with dry spores to uh, wear a, uh, like a NIOSH 95, you know, like for the COVID virus mask to, to uh, prevent inhalation, because you can develop some sensitivity, uh, some allergy to, uh, to these fungi if you're exposed to the spores on a chronic basis. Uh, the allergy is basically like a mild cold. You get sniffles, maybe a sore throat, uh, maybe uh, your eyes uh, are running. Uh, so it's important to wear uh, personal protection when working with these, also with clubs. Okay, uh, this is another technique uh, is you take a concrete mixer, uh, you uh, put a, a plexiglass plate with a hole in the center, you take a vacuum cleaner that has a good cyclone uh, dust collection system, a bagless vacuum cleaner, and you connect it up here, you put your substrate in the mixer, it tumbles and adds, makes agitation, and you collect the spores with a vacuum cleaner. You know, the, the, the one problem is you need one vacuum cleaner for every strain if you're working with multiple strains because there's no way to clean these vacuum cleaners out. Uh, this is uh, something that I've discovered the last couple of years. These are Chinese powder separators uh, for the Chinese kitchen. Uh, I gather they're used to eliminate dust from the rice from soybeans and so on. These are small tabletop vibratory sieves. Um, and here you see the sieve with a, on top of a 10 mesh, and below that is a 20 mesh, and then the bottom is the, the, the catch for the, all the spores. And so here is the metarizium culture with mar glass children's marbles to, to, to make the physical abrasion. You seal it up, um, in this case, um, I have a plastic bag attached to this spout and the spores all come down into the plastic bag. For small scale production, this, this is uh, ideal. Um, today I spent, um, I have two of these and I, I spent uh, about six hours um, uh, harvesting spores from about uh, eight kilograms of, of, of culture for, for a client. Um, Okay, and then you can, if you're doing larger amounts, you can actually con connect one of these things to a uh, cyclone dust collector, uh, which is interesting, interestingly enough for the hobby carpentry industry. And it's designed to take, collect fine powder so it does not clog your vacuum cleaner if you're cleaning up all the wood dust, sawdust. And so the way this works is you connect it up the, spore, the, the spores are here and they drop down. Any, any uh, solid particulates larger than the spores go into the vacuum cleaner or are collected. But this is where the spores are. And you can, so you can run this as a continuous system uh, and, and harvest larger amounts of spores, uh, kilograms of spores. Uh, this is a larger sieve. Um, again, um, it's 50 centimeters in diameter, same principle. 
Uh, and again, you can hook it up to one of these cyclone dust collectors. Uh, these things, in the United States, these are cost about a hundred dollars on on Amazon. Um, this uh, this uh, again, this is Chinese made. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, you can also find them on eBay. Uh, they run about five hundred dollars. Uh, for even larger, you can buy uh, cyclone dust collectors that are designed for the carpentry industry. I had one of these in USDA. Um, basically, a very high power fan. The, the spores are collected on this cyclone and they're dropped into this container. And the air, the, the exhaust air, then goes through a HEPA filter so that you're not contaminating your entire environment. Uh, commercially, there's something called the micro harvester which is produced in England. It's unfortunately quite expensive, um, but it uses um, fluid bed technology. The substrate's put in here. It bounces around, uh, well, like popcorn, for those of you who have made popcorn. Uh, the spores are dislodged from the substrate and then come through and collected in this stainless steel cyclone. And the spores are accumulated down here. Uh, this is the sort of principle behind it. I won't go into details. This is a commercial operation in Senegal. So the, the, the cultures, the dry cultures, are carefully uh, put into this uh, drum, which tumbles them. Okay? And that abrasion then dislodges the spores from the substrate. Then the spores, and there's air moving through this at fairly high velocity. So the spores are then taken up through here, and then they're collected in a series of, of cyclones, and the spores are gathered uh, in the bottom. So there's one of these operations, actually, a friend of mine was just in Uganda, the small uh, biopesticide company, and they had this for, produce, for collecting the, the metarizium and bovaria spores. Uh, so, um, trying to get to the end here, quality is as important as quantity. So you want efficient recovery. You want a high and consistent purity. You really need high initial viability, at least 90%, which is a, a criterion for most of the commercial products. And you want good shelf life. In the, in the United States and Europe, the definition of good shelf life is 12 months at 25 Celsius with less than 10% loss in viability of a dry spore powder in a sealed container. And of, of, of course, you want consistent infectivity, virulence, efficacy. Um, best, the best recovery possible is necessary um, because you want, it, uh, you want as much spores off that substrate as possible. So if you're, you're wanting 10 to the 13th canidia per hectare, and you're getting that on a one kilogram of substrate, but if you got, and if you got 95% recovery, you're getting 95% of that from a kilogram. But if your recovery of spores from the substrate is only 80%, you need one, one and a quarter times more substrate for one hectare worth of fungus. So you have to find a good system for high, high efficient recovery. Um, the other effect is if you're formulating uh, into some kind of oil formulation or wettable powder, the, the purity of your spores, the spores per gram of spore powder really affects the, the formula that you're going to need. So for example, you're making a wettable powder of two times 10 to the 13th spores per pound. Uh, if your technical grade, your spore powder is one times 10 to the 11th per gram, you're making 200 grams of canidia, 254 grams of, well, inerts, but they're not really inerts. They're suspension agents, uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, but if your uh, purity is much higher, if you're getting 1.5 times 10 to the 11th instead of one, you only need 133 grams of spores and 321 grams of inerts. Um, and so you want the highest purity possible. But you also have to maintain consistency if you have regulators in your country, like we have in the United States, that say um, your, 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 your formula, 
of your formulation has to meet certain specifications uh, in terms of weight, which is a, it's a stupid thing that came from the chemical pesticide industry. Um, and so uh, you can't, you're, you're, uh, the amount of spores cannot vary by more than 10%. Okay, uh, canidial viability, uh, what you typically get with Bovaria and Cordyceps is, is better than 90% viable on the dry spores. Metarhizium, for some reason, loses some viability uh, during the drying process. Several of us uh, have uh, come together and tried to figure out what's going on, and we don't quite understand it. Uh, so usually metarhizium, your viability drops to 70-80%, regardless of drying speed. The only way you can do it is very rapid drying. In other words, your, your, your culture, your sporulated culture, is completely dried within 24 hours. That's difficult, unless you do freeze drying, um, and that's expensive. So it's, this is sort of a fact of life. One reason why I prefer Bovaria myself. Um, then again, how does the viability affect um, as well as the purity affect what's going into your products? So let's say a Bovaria wettable powder with this kind of specification, uh, you've got two levels of, uh, well, you've got one level of purity, but then your viability changes. So that means you have to use different amounts of spore powder in your formulation. So your formula changes. There we go. Okay. Um, in general, let's see, I, I think this is out of place. This was my schematic for producing um, any of these fungi uh, on a laboratory basis. Let's say I'm doing 10 kilograms or 20 kilograms of substrate. Maintaining quality, uh, shelf life, again, um, here I say in less than 20% loss of viability, it's really 10% uh, one year at 2025. That's what the regulators in, insist on. Um, and it can be affected by many, uh, by a number of conditions, if the strain itself, the moisture content. This is why you want dry spores, temperature. You don't want to store your spores at 35 Celsius. You want to store them at uh, 10 or 15 Celsius, ideally for long-term storage. Um, to some extent, nutrition fermentation conditions can affect. This is not well understood. Um, there's some work out of Brazil using auger media, which doesn't really extrapolate to solid substrate. Um, and then of course, the formulation and the packaging can affect uh, your shelf life, depending on the packaging being, let's say water, water can go into the package uh, and so on. So again, strain differences, I talked about this yesterday. Uh, this is a typical temp effect of temperature on Bovaria. This is percent of original viability, in, in this case activity. So it's all set to 100 in the beginning. And you can see how the viability loss at different temperatures. So the best is at 15, 25. Oh, here's 25, sorry. Um, here's 15. Uh, if you go to 35 or 30 Celsius, you can see already a much uh, faster loss. Uh, and yes, we ran these experiments for 450 days. Uh, this was at the data we did generated in Mycotech. Uh, and again, you can see what happens at 35 uh, Celsius and 40 Celsius. Um, so you have to be able to, even, even in a formulation, you need to be able to store your fungus uh, at a reasonable temperature. Certainly 20, 25 Celsius is okay. Um, again, 25 Celsius, you've lost 10% of your activity in about 120 days. Um, if, you, if, you're, if your uh, regulators allow you to lose a little bit more activity, let's say 20% activity, uh, you're running about 200 days. Uh, now, that's the, the loss of activity is kind of a, a, a number that's in your regu in the regulatory mind. Um, we still really have, don't have a good understanding of how much viability do you need to lose before a farmer using the fungus properly sees a loss in efficacy. Uh, several of us think it's at least 50%, maybe even 60% even, uh, loss in viability before the farmer sees the product not working. Um, and, but it, it, it really has never been uh, carefully evaluated using field trials. 
um, to my knowledge. Um, you can take all that data and for a strain, you can make a prediction. Uh, this is for GHA, the effect of temperature on the, the time to 50% loss of, of activity. And there's your regressions. Um, and it does vary. So these are production lots from 1999. These are uh, tons of spores. And you can see that the we ran this test for almost two years. Uh, and you can see there's some production batches. Uh, we're using the highly automated system, which, you know, the, the most of them are in here. There's some very good ones and some very uh, poor ones with, and here's the half-life and days. This was a, quote, controlled system. And yet we know that there's some variables in there. So this is a fact of life. And this can also be scaled down if you're doing it in bags, as well as high fermentation. Packaging can affect your shelf life. Hard-sided versus flexible packages, plastic versus foil. Some, if you look on the internet and you see how many uh, biopesticide companies are selling their product, it, it's now in aluminized uh, uh, plastic foil pouches, which are oxygen impermeable, which are water impermeable. Uh, and these, th that's the two big uh, characteristics. Uh, for good shelf life, uh, analogy I have is, is in fire prevention. You know, in fire, you need oxygen, you need an ignition source, and you need uh, the, the material to burn. So in the case of spores, what is a loss in shelf life? The spores begin to germinate. Their met metabolism is activated, but conditions are insufficient for them to complete germination, so they die. So in terms of uh, preventing spores from germinating in a package, you have oxygen, some sort of ignition source, which is trace carbohydrates that came off with the substrate, and then you have uh, moisture as the sort of uh, ign ignition source. And so you need to block one or more of these for very, very good shelf life. The typical approach is again, dry these spores down to uh, water activity of 0 0.3, 0 0.25. Um, you can exclude oxygen by using the, the foil pouches. Uh, one company actually uh, goes to the extent of putting in oxygen scavenger inside the package to make sure that any oxygen is, is eliminated. So the spores are not tricked into beginning to germinate. Glucose, you can't, you know, the trace carbohydrates, you can't really eliminate because they come off as microscopic particles along with the spores. Okay, so you, you keep stuff very dry and you try to block the oxygen. Those are the best, the best tools. So this is an example. This is a Metarizium, Met52, which was commercialized by uh, Novozymes here in the United States and Europe, and they use aluminum foil pouches with a desiccant and an oxygen scavenger. Okay, that's it. Um, and so that's in a nutshell some uh, considerations. Now, when we do the um, uh, the videos, we'll be going through a lot of these stages of the cooking process, and of course. Uh, uh, you know, inshallah, we, we get to Sri Lanka or another uh, country in Southeast Asia for the workshop, and we'll give you uh, the, the participants, you know, hands-on experience on how to do this, how to inoculating a bag, uh, uh, transferring the bag for, for drying and so on, how to make subcultures, how to isolate from the insect. So between the videos coming up this summer and the, um, uh, in the fall, some uh, uh, hands-on training, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll give uh, you all some, uh, enough experience to, to begin to cook for yourself, if you will. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stefan. So it's been really late for you, but uh, you managed to complete everything for the participants. Uh, we really appreciate your time that you have given us. And uh, for all the participants, uh, we will share the recording with you. We see, uh, you know, some of them left just before 10 minutes. And so for those, we will be uh, making sure to send the recordings. And 
Yeah, so on behalf of Apari also, I would like to thank Dr. Stefan for your time and uh, for the great lecture series. So as Dr. Stefan was mentioning, uh, so this will be our next, uh, you know, this will be like a preliminary lecture for you all to understand the process and we will be having in-person workshops in our, any one of our partner countries. So we will be trying to have it in Sri Lanka as planned before. We'll keep you updated with that. With that few remarks, uh, so, you know, since uh, considering the time that we have yep. and considering it's very late for Dr. Stefan, you can ask your questions and uh, to Dr. Stefan's email and he'll be replying to that. Uh, yes. We'll share the email with you as well. Okay. Also, um, uh, through uh, 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 Dr. Sasi, I'll distribute some uh, literature. Um, there's some good, uh, uh, the chapter out of the, the laboratory manual for invertebrate pathology on growing your own fungi, fungi especially relevant to laboratory uh, production, um, as well as this new review on how these fungi are produced all over the world, uh, state of the art, uh, plus some other publications that I'd be happy to share with you. And what I'll do uh, is I will send them to Dr. Sasi and she can either uh, email them to everyone, or maybe we set up a uh, Dropbox site or some other uh, site where people can just go and, and download um, this literature. Um, I also have some, uh, actually, a PDF of books that could be very, very useful, including um, our Bible, which is uh, Microbial Control of Insects and Mites by Larry Lacey, which was published a few years ago. And before he passed away, he put it up on ResearchGate for free. Uh, and um, uh, I have a copy of that, which we can then share uh, among uh, interested participants, uh, particularly those people who are involved with actually using the fungi and testing the fungi for uh, uh, practical control. So. So, you know, look forward to those in the next few weeks. Thank you so much, Dr. Stefan. Uh, so with that, I will be sharing the materials that Dr. Stefan is sharing and we'll share the recording. And once again, uh, our sincere thanks to Dr. Stefan for staying up until 1 p.m. 1 <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, I, now I have to force myself to go to sleep. <laughs> anyway. Thank okay. you all. Yeah. Okay.